Hi, Glennis. Hey, Aaron. What do you want to talk about today? How much I f- hate diets. <laughs> yeah, diets suck. <laughs> so what do you do instead of a diet? Intuitive eating. Health at every size. So how many times have you had to explain intuitive eating and health at every size to someone? Like 5,000 times. But and- that was just to my doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so how many times have you explained it to someone and then they said, but diets are the only thing I know? That's like every time. Can we pursue health without thinking about weight? Yes, we can pursue health without thinking about weight. That's pretty revolutionary what you just said. But what if you just don't like yourself at the size that you're at? I think we need to understand why instead of just saying I need to change. So, what's the deal with body positivity? Oh man, that's a long answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Aaron Flores. And I'm Glennis Oyston. And we are Dietitians, Dietitians Unplugged. Unplugged. <laughs> hey, welcome back to the Dietitians Unplugged podcast. I am here with my awesome co host, Aaron. And, Aaron, as determined in previous episodes, I'm not going to ask you how are you doing, but. Thank you. <laughs> but what is new in your world? Anything? Oy, that's such a big question. Okay. <laughs> um, it, no, it, listen, it, here's here's some of the, you know, obviously we're all still struggling with um, COVID and the effects it's having on our both mental health, but also the our loved ones around us and continuing to try to, you know, be safe and, and isolate. Um so definitely still struggling with that in, in a lot of ways and definitely doing a lot of thought process around all of the racial injustices in our country. I continue to spend a lot of time thinking about that and how to, you know, continue to work on dismantling white supremacy. So, you know, little small things like that, nothing, nothing major, mm, mm-hmm. um, you know, see, Actually, I do things at CFD. They, um, I've been, I have a new title. It's a very fancy title. I feel honored to have it and completely embarrassed. But I'm the senior coordinator of weight inclusive care for Center for Discovery, which means role, you know, trying to implement health at every size haze throughout all of Center for Discovery, not just you know an outpatient, but in residential and looking at policies, looking at how do we identify weight bias in our treatment center? How do we dismantle fat phobia? Um, The things are inherent within treatment centers. And so it's, it's a great, overwhelming, busy new job, but I'm super excited about it and, and juggling that with my private practice. So I would say I have about five seconds free every day. Wow. Well, that is a great title too. Yeah. Right? Also, it's senior, so you're a senior now. <laughs> I am a senior. Yeah, AARP memberships uh, included. Yeah. Listen, you and I are not too far away from being AARP. I am not too far away. Eligible. <laughs> August. August. I will be 48. That's exciting. It's just still young and yeah. in my world then. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's been a tough time for sure. Um, just a lot of stuff going on. How are you holding up through um, it? You know, holding up, it's not the happiest time in the world. So just reminding myself every day that this is probably temporary. The The intensity of, of stuff going on, especially with like the lockdowns and in LA, they've kind of closed the reopening and, you know, really kind of stuck inside quite a bit. So just trying to remember like that is temporary um, and, you know, just really focusing on getting through each day <laughs> mentally intact, I think has been quite fun. Um, that's sarcastic. It's not been fun at all, but, um, however, I will say that my clients are keeping me really busy and I'm really happy about that. I think if it were not for having pretty much a full practice right now that I would be really, really struggling. Um, and you know, like you, I'm, I'm really busy all day, and I'm so grateful for all my clients who are working so hard uh, at all their own work. And um, yeah, just generally finding things to be grateful about, which is which is my work right now. It's definitely a, a, a challenging time for so many of us and so many important discussions that need to sort of happen. To be honest, like 
they're really hard discussions around disparities of health and, and, and finances and wealth and, you know, access to care and access to, um, you know, making sure our, our systems are, are are equitable, right? Not just equal, but equitable. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I think, but I'm, here's the thing. I'm, I'm, I'm really thankful when I find folks who are really willing to engage in those conversations. And I would say one of the, one of the things that has come of this is I'm noticing the group of colleagues that I'm able to build some, some deeper bonds with are around these conversations. And, and that feels very nice. Um, and it's still really just like you hard every day. Like it's just, it is really hard every day. Yeah. And I remember that, you know, in general, my life is good. So, you know, that, that's important for me is that, you know, I go back to, well, and my life is good. But the great thing is, with everybody at home most in most of the world, and not most of the world, in much of the world, we are getting, like, you know, to connect with great podcast guests. Very true. You want to tell us about yeah. today's host? Yes. Um, this came up as somebody um, somebody I know is struggling with or, or will be planning on getting pregnant and mentioned this person to me, uh, Nicola Salmon, and she is in the U.K., and she is a fat positive fertility coach, feminist, and author of Fat and Fertile. She advocates for change in how fat people are treated while accessing help with their fertility. Nicholas supports fat people who want to get pregnant using her fat positive fertility framework to find their own version of health without diets, advocate for their bodies, relearn how to trust their body, and believe in their ability to get pregnant in their current body. So she, th I just felt like we did a PCOS episode a couple years ago with Julie Dillon, and um, we haven't really touched on fertility since then or pregnancy since then. And I thought this is just such a great time because I'm hearing a lot of people being told, a lot of people in larger bodies being told that they are like essentially too fat to get pregnant. They're going to have to lose weight. That's mm -hmm. what they're being told by doctors. And so- yeah. Um, I just thought we just need to have somebody on to talk about this. And I thought it was kind of yeah. interesting because you also have kind of your own experience with with um yeah. that world. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, my um my partner has PCOS and it definitely affected her getting pregnant and you know how we had to navigate all of that. And it was very I was like in the in the, my internship, right? So I, I hadn't really done a lot of haze work and I hadn't done a lot of intuitive eating work. Um, so I wasn't as like tuned in to all of the weight stigma that might've shown up, but I definitely noticed it. And, and what was interesting is we had a few doctors who, we, you know, we would come in with questions. And the one I remember the most was this doctor, we came in and asked the question about, um, cause we have twins and, and we, we had some help. Um, we had some fertility help to, and that's the reason we have twins. And so we had to go to a perinatologist. And I remember we came in with a couple questions and we said, what's your theory on so blah, 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 blah. I forget what the question was. And, and, this, and he looks at both of us and he goes, I don't have theory. I have facts. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and I was like, Holy mackerel. Buddy, you and like it was just like it was like the most off putting thing I've ever heard a doctor say. Um, and 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 yet, um, you know, we sort of we didn't have to stay with him, obviously, but we did, uh, because he was he was good at a lot of things he did. Um, just horrible, sort of like ego, and and thank goodness there was, um, wasn't any like sort of fat phobic stuff coming out of his mouth. Um, but it, it, it was definitely, it was definitely a really interesting and hard period, you know, like to, to struggle with that. And, and, and even as a male, right. To not really quite, you know, um, it's not my lived experience. Right. And it's not a part of my, uh, DNA makeup, right. To, to sort of, to give birth. And so it was really, uh, a, a challenging time for both of us to try to like, 
navigate healthcare and navigate what was possible, what was doable and how long we might struggle. So, and, and again, we were incredibly fortunate because it happened relatively easy for us, but it gave us just a short example of how hard it could be. Yeah. It's always amazing to me how doctors really struggle with that compassion piece with, with patients. Right, yeah. like here's somebody coming in. You're obviously coming in because you've been having a hard time getting pregnant, which is stressful. And um, you know, it's like we I've got facts, and it's like okay, um, like screw yeah, you. Yeah, <laughs> it just seems like, gosh, so much about the body is theoretical. I feel like you know, obviously, mm-hmm. if you cut into it, it bleeds. But you know, I. In terms of the more nebulous parts of health, it's like, are we sure that works? Are we sure this? But you know, and somebody's saying, "Well, I've got facts," and it's like, okay, I guess you cannot be questioned. So that that sounds right. very stressful. Very well. We have Nicola here to kind of take the scary out of being in a larger body and fertility and pregnancy, and I think people are going to find this a really helpful episode. So. Without any further delay, here is our episode with Nicola Salmon. Well, Nicola, thank you so much for coming on the show today and spending some time talking to us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to talk to you both. Yeah, us too. I mean, I think this is a topic that a lot of our listeners have questions about. Uh, I I hear questions about this all the time. So uh, uh, we're really excited to have you on the show. Thank you. So to start, why don't you just tell us a little bit about how you came to this work and um, and doing this work around fat positive fertility? Sure. So it's kind of been one of those paths that was long and winding and and got me there in the end. But um, I I, my journey started when I was 16. Um, I was diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is a hormonal and metabolic condition, which meant that my periods were screwed up and I was in a slightly bigger body and I had acne, excess hair, all these wonderful things for a teenage girl. And um, the doctor told me that I wouldn't be able to get pregnant. So from 16, I was expecting things to be really difficult for me in terms of becoming a parent. Um, and that kind of led my choices as regards to what I ended up doing. So I trained as a clinical scientist originally, but then um, something happened in my life and I tried acupuncture and it was amazing and I loved it. So I decided to train as an acupuncturist. And because of my history with PCOS, I decided to specialize in fertility acupuncture. Um, and it was Kind of during this time that I'd met my husband, we got married, and we were ready to start start our own family. And I was expecting to have to go down the assisted conception route and for everything to be really difficult. But we got pregnant really quickly um, with both our children. And that was kind of the first tiny seed that got planted in my mind of, well, if it's so easy for me to get pregnant, and I was in a much bigger body by then, I was kind of classified as quote unquote clinically obese. Um, and had really irregular cycles with my PCOS. Why was it so easy for me to get pregnant when I was told it was going to be so difficult? Um, And then when I had my kids, all this time, I'd been kind of on this yo-yo dieting journey of trying to lose the weight because that's what I was told was good for my PCOS if I was to lose weight. And once I'd had my first son, I realized that I didn't want to pass on all the stuff that I had around weight loss, around my body, Mm -hmm. around food to him so that was really the kicker that got me to quit dieting to stop to say look I've had enough of this no more um and that kind of left a big hole in my life of okay well if I'm not a fat person who wants to lose weight what does that mean like who am I like I'd spent so much of my life wrapped up in this identity of of trying to lose weight and so luckily I stumbled into the world of haze via Instagram I found lots of people in fat bodies who were actually just enjoying life and not worried about weight loss and not worried about what people thought of them. And I was just like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And the more I read about it, the more I uncovered about diets and how diets are shit and BMI is rubbish. And I was just like, oh my gosh, like I was just lapping it all up. 
Um, and kind of in my professional career, I was a fertility acupuncturist. I trained as a fertility coach at this point because I wanted to give my clients like more in terms of support and in terms of tools that they could use in their lives. And it just, I was like, well, why is nobody talking about this in the fertility world? Like fertility world is rife with diet culture. Like there's so many quote unquote fertility diets that talk about cutting out foods, every kind of food you can imagine. Um, and I was like, oh my gosh, like, why is nobody talking about this in the fertility world? Why is everybody just being told to lose weight when they want to get pregnant? So I kind of took a deep breath and thought, okay, well, if nobody else is talking about it, then I guess I'm going to have to kind of step up and talk about it because, you know, I'd, by this point I'd had my children and I knew that in a parallel universe, I'd be the person who was struggling to get pregnant, being told to lose weight, being sent away, not being supported. And I had this kind of mental and um, kind of emotional energy to be able to speak for these people because I'd been able to complete my family. And I know that for people who are still going through that journey, that having to do this work and having to have those conversations and stand up for yourself is so difficult and so emotionally draining. So I almost felt like I didn't have a choice and that I had to just kind of start talking about this stuff and kind of learn as I go. It's so interesting. Your story about, that kind of leads into my next question. And you said like, why is nobody talking about this that there's a whole other way to go about health and fertility and all of that? So many women have been told by their doctors that they're quote unquote too fat. I'm sure they use a different word, but you're too big to get pregnant or maintain a pregnancy and that they have to lose weight before they get, you know, before they attempt to get pregnant. Why do you think that's become such a common piece of advice? I think it really boils down to the basic assumption that most healthcare professionals make or have been taught that fat is bad, that fat people are unhealthy. And any kind of, the more I dig into like the research around all these associated risks, it really is not black and white in the way that people talk about it. So for example, I recently just wrote a blog post about miscarriage and the statistics that are talked about all the time is that people who are in bigger bodies have higher rates of miscarriage. And whilst the statistics of the papers generally kind of half of them show there's a correlation. Um, and the risk is always said as like, you're double the risk and it's going to, you know, 70% times more likely and all these kind of sensationalized statistics. When actually it's a difference of like between five to 10, 10%. And actually the research is really mixed. Like half of it shows a correlation. Half of it doesn't show any correlation at all. And the half that does show a correlation, they've not found any kind of biological mechanism to explain it. Um, and none of it takes into account anything like weight stigma or any of the increased stress and anxiety that these people are going under based on the treatment that they're given in fat bodies. So it really is not the whole story. And yeah, there's so many of these tiny examples that really build up to create this picture of kind of fat bodies are not capable of getting pregnant and fat bodies can't sustain a healthy pregnancy. But actually, it's all based on that underlying foundational assumption that we know isn't true. So it all kind of comes collapsing down when you start taking the, the blocks out. Right. And I'm wondering if that research also accounts for women who might be in higher weight bodies and have been told to lose weight and are trying to actively diet mm -hmm. while pregnant. Mm -hmm. Um, or keep their consumption down so that they don't gain too much weight, right? Because in the dietitian world, we tell women of different sizes that they're allowed to gain different amounts of weight. So if you're a quote unquote, you know, normal, I'm not even going to use that word, a smaller mm -hmm. size, you can gain, you're allowed to gain X pounds. But if you're at a higher weight body, the amount of weight you're told to gain is so much less than that. Yes even though you're growing the same size human probably and you, right? Like the same kind of human, right? And I'm just wondering if that research, and I'm guessing it doesn't, but you can confirm this for me, if that research accounts for that, that, that we're telling women in larger bodies actively to not eat as much during pregnancy. No, it doesn't. It doesn't take into account the fact that these women have probably dieted for huge like amounts of time before they were trying to get pregnant. It doesn't account for any kind of, decreased calorific intake you know while they're 
in that kind of trying to conceive period. Um, and we've, there's evidence coming out now that shows that if you're on like a very low calorie diet or a restrictive diet, when you're in that, you know, those initial phases of when life begins, that it does have a detrimental impact. And yeah, like some people I, that I've spoken to have been told that they need to actively start to try and lose weight during pregnancy, which it just, it just, you know, it makes me so angry that they could be given that information from a healthcare professional that they trust. It has the potential to do so much harm to the development of 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 the fetus of 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 the mom. I mean, it's just it, you're right. It it's it so sad that that's what the automatic advice may be. Mm, and it's you know, it's just one of those things that you're like, what? Apart from like the actual like negative calorific intake that they're taking, it goes beyond that, so that these people are you know actively feeling panicked and stressed going to their doctor's appointments because they're worried about what the scale is going to say and you know this will consume their entire pregnancies and this should be a time when they're you know excited and joyful and all they're doing is like having to count what they're eating and you know like feel so stressed and anxious about the whole thing you know it's it's interesting it's making me think of my mother's own birth story that she told me years ago which is well, my mother was very steeped in diet culture well before i was born and there were pictures of her and she looks way underweight for what i knew her to be like more at a you know there were pictures of her at a normal weight for her and then pictures before i was born and she was you know very very unnaturally thin for her and then told me that she went through a pregnancy and didn't gain any weight and that she was the exact same weight as when I came out as when she, as before she got pregnant. Mm -hmm. And when I was young, I'm like, oh, okay, whatever. And now as a dietitian, I know like, wow, that was a huge problem, yeah. <laughs> you know? And it was a complicated birth and I was a gigantic baby because like I was just like sucking up whatever nutrients I could get probably. And um and she had said, like, it took her a long time to get pregnant, so I think she thought she wasn't going to get pregnant, and I'm just curious about how much of that dieting history came into it. And it's just so interesting when you start to put pieces together, and it, of course, it's anecdotal, but it's just sort of like, oh, you know, and of course, being a woman afraid to gain weight during a pregnancy and being proud that she gained no weight during a pregnancy, and this was almost 50 years ago, mm -hmm. um, it's, like, shocking to me, and I don't think it's any different now. I think women are still terrified and they have a baby and it's like, oh, I gained weight. And it's, it's so, we have such a negative, um, a negative approach to fertility and to pregnancy, I feel like. And then as soon as you've got the baby, you're expected to like bounce back immediately to your kind of pre-baby body, mm -hmm. which is like, how is that even a thing? Like you've just given birth to a human being. You're, you know, like exhausted from the lack of sleep and exhausted from the birth and, you know, all these things you've just gone through as a human. And and now you're expected that weight loss should be your number one priority. It, it just, it just, just, it's just crazy. Yeah. You know, you might not be able to answer this, but I think one of the things that you mentioned when you started to, to talk about this was, you know, the research sort of gets reported in one way, mm. um, but if you really look at the data, right, right, it's really saying something else. It makes me think of one, how, at least here in the US, and I don't know if this is the same in the, in the UK, but like how research is reported as news when it's, you know, and it becomes sensationalized in, yeah. in some way. And, you know, sort of the laziness uh, and the fat phobia that shows up in, in healthcare where people are not really like going deeper, much deeper than the headline, mm -hmm. um, and and so I'm wondering like if if there if if that's something you notice in the UK around sensationalized headlines and and the medical profession there. Well, yeah, I mean it seems to be that there are all these like quotes that all the doctors come out with, and it makes me feel that maybe that this is stuff they're taught, but actually it's got no kind of evidence behind it. So a classic example that. The doctors often come out with is that if you just lose between five to ten percent of your body weight that's going to kick start your fertility and you'll probably get pregnant and there's actually no evidence that there's no dose dependent studies that show that if you lose x percent of your body weight or x pounds that your fertility is going to increase by x amount and it actually it's it's just quite harmful and what it's actually 
what I think it's actually showing is that it's actually the health promoting behaviors that maybe people are starting to do more of as they're kind of trying to pursue weight loss is actually the thing that's having the positive impact. So if we can just focus on the health promoting behaviors and encouraging people to, you know, look on, look at ways that they can support their body rather than focusing all on the weight loss, then the doctors would have much better effects, right? Yeah. Interesting. So in, in your, in your experience, aside from PO, PCOS, um, you know, which is often associated with higher body weight and, and fertility issues, is there any evidence for other like weight related fertility issues. So like, in other words, is there any evidence that higher weight bodies have more difficulty getting pregnant than smaller bodies? So there is some, again, mixed research that shows that people in higher weight bodies tend to take longer to get pregnant. Um, not that they won't kind of, if you look kind of at the end of life, there's still the same amount of people, but it just takes them slightly longer time but even with the kind of PCOS picture, it's it's all around like the fact that they one of the classic signs of PCOS is this kind of delayed ovulation and you're not sure when you're ovulating, which kind of when you put that into the picture of getting pregnant is obviously a really big part of the puzzle. Um, that's pretty important. Yeah. Yeah. We kind of <laughs> need to know when that's going on to get pregnant. And but realistically, the, there's no there's no causation between like higher weight and in you know and fertility issues it's all around the fact that you know this PCOS is happening and the side effects of that are delayed ovulation and kind of potential weight gain so it's not the weight that's causing the issues it's just that these two things can occur at the same time with the same syndrome and PCOS is so under-researched and not very well understood in the kind of medical field so it's really difficult for people to start making these assumptions and say, okay, well, if you just lost weight, it would help the problem. And in actual fact, it doesn't really work like that. I'm wondering too, if, if in the research you've come along, um, any evidence around higher weight bodies and developing like gestational diabetes, because I know that that's another huge fear that clients have. And it's people in general, like, oh, I'm in a higher weight body and I'm I've been told I'm going to develop gestational diabetes. And interestingly, the only person I personally know that developed gestational diabetes was a very thin person. So I'm just curious what the actual evidence around that says, um, if there is any or if you know of yeah, any. Yeah, I'm, I'm just grabbing up some some work that I did on this. So there's, again, really mixed evidence around this, but kind of the standard, one of the papers that I found that looked into this was if you had like a quote unquote normal BMI, that your chance of getting gestational diabetes was 2.3%. And that is kind of sensationalized to sound like, oh my gosh, like when you have a higher BMI, that it's going to be so much more. But actually, if your BMI is between 30 to 35, it's 5.5%. So it's double the risk, but the risk is still relatively small. So 95% of people you know, with a BMI of 30 to 35 won't get gestational diabetes. And like you say, we know people in smaller bodies who get it. And again, this research doesn't account for the weight cycling and the dieting that these people will have gone through, anything that they're actively doing to lose weight, and any kind of weight stigma that they're facing with their healthcare professionals. So it really isn't the whole picture at all. Right. And hereditary factors must come into play mm. too with that. Yeah, definitely. Just because we know, you know, diabetes is highly hereditary. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so what you're saying is that even if you, you may have an increased risk based on this yeah. evidence, but the overall, your, your overall risk of that happening is still very, very yeah. low. But when you talk to your healthcare professionals about it, that's not always the picture that they paint. They often paint it as like, oh, well, this is very likely to happen. I know for me personally, when I was going through my pregnancies, they were shocked when I didn't have it. And that, you know, like I had completely normal, unremarkable pregnancies. And, and they were, you know, like you could see on their face, they're like, oh, well, you haven't got this. And that is a surprise. And yeah, it really affects the care that you get from your healthcare professionals. Yeah. It's sort of like diagnosis weight yes. stigma. <laughs> right. 
It's it's like um, we've had people in the diabetes groups that uh, we ran a couple of years ago that I did with Rebecca Scritchfield. Somebody came in, they said, well, I've been diagnosed with pre-pre-diabetes. Oh and we, look, we looked at each other and we're like, what is that? Pre-pre-diabetes, we're like, that's called not diabetes. Um, <laughs> and they were in a larger body. And we're like, I think what you got diagnosed with was weight stigma. And, you know, that's what your diagnosis actually is, is that you're suffering from, you don't have it, your doctor has it, and is sort of putting that on you that, well, you don't have it yet, but you're in a large body, so you're going to get it. So it sounds like the same Mm -hmm. thing with pregnant women, like, well, you're in a large body, so you're probably going to have a hard time getting pregnant. Yeah, and then with the gestational diabetes, I know some people have had to have repeat tests because they're in bigger bodies and the doctor just you know it's just waiting you're like come on you know you're definitely going to get this so we're just going to keep testing you until we get the result we want right Mm. and you mentioned a little bit before about like health promoting behaviors that people might have engaged in when they're trying to lose weight and so in terms of fertility what are those health promoting behaviors i mean when we talk about health promoting behaviors fertility is not really anything special i mean it's just Mm. it's just Mm -hmm. your health it's just another aspect (laughs) of your health like your reproductive organs are all squished in with your stomach and your intestines and your liver and your kidneys. Like there's no, there's no kind of special magic formula that's going to support your fertility. It's just another indicator of what's going on with your, your overall health and well-being because it's all internet, interconnected. So, you know, things like eating more vegetables and things like moving your body in a really way that feels joyful and drinking enough water and getting enough sleep. Like these are all things that, you know, sound really obvious when you talk about them, but actually you know like so many people don't get great night's sleep or so many people won't remember to drink water enough and you know that's quite important for getting pregnant because you need to be hydrated to create cervical mucus for you know all these things to happen but yeah there's no, it's nothing special it's, you don't have to just eat kale and avocados and you know all those things it's just making sure that your diet is well balanced that you're eating enough because so many people aren't eating enough um, sleeping enough and moving in a way that feels good. It's, it sounds really simple. Yeah, I, I asked that because I think there are a lot of people thinking, well, what is the special formula? And everybody's looking for infertility. That one pill, that one thing. Yeah. Like, it's because people have no control over when they can get pregnant. They're looking for that one thing that they can control. And often diet is the obvious thing, but it just becomes this obsession and it comes just you know, it really just becomes disordered eating. You know, that, that point of saying it's so out of your control, I think is something that we need to make more space for. It sounds like too, because, you know, it is even with all things lining up to have no fertility issues, it still might take a while, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. so much of, of this is out of your control. And, And as a, listen, as a parent, I would say, um, it's probably like your first lesson in that, like you can't control everything. Uh, you better get used to it because this is the lesson. Like, like, you know, you can't these, but like we, but we want that solution, right? We want that sort of immediate fix. Uh, so it makes sense why so many folks will go to any length to, to sort of take as many variables that they see out of the problem, right. Or out of the, out of the mix. Um, so, I mean, it, it just makes sense. And I want to offer so much sort of self-compassion to that process. Mm, because we're sold this idea that, you know, like nutrition and how we move our body are the things that control our mm-hmm. health. But we know through the social determinants of health that that is really only a small piece of that puzzle. And there's way there's loads of other things that are going on, you know, such as like our socioeconomic situation and our genetics and you know, all these other things impact our health in much bigger ways and i feel that if people were given the full picture that'd be like okay well i can relax a little bit because that one cup of coffee or that one glass of wine is not going to make or break this Mm -hmm. yeah and i think there's so much i uh, what i think is that there seems to be so much guilt that people take on to themselves not like on purpose but like i think women feel so responsible if they're not getting pregnant and there's so much sort of they feel like, like Aaron, you said, like it's out of your control, right? But yet we're feeling like this is something we should be able to control. And women are feeling very guilty around not being able to get pregnant when 
this just might be sort of the natural course of things for this particular person. Mm. We're definitely sold this idea, aren't we, that as, you know, females of the species, it's our job to procreate and, you know, like that's the in our society and in our culture, like so much value of women is put on that idea of having children and raising children when actually, you know, that's not the be all and end all, but we often feel like it is. And there's that kind of primal urge sometimes for people to to want to have children and when they can't and they're told that it's their weight that's the problem, then they're, that just it's this whole shame spiral that they go down. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's too bad because we're not, 100% in control of our health. I think it's a much higher <laughs> I think the the amount of control we actually have I think is probably in reality very low. So um but mm-hmm. but we're kind of told otherwise. So I'm I'm wondering what strategies you might suggest for women who are considering fertility treatments and they're coming up against weight stigma in the medical field. Mm, so When I work with with people, I kind of have a four-pronged approach to it. So some of it's to do with the the, the health-promoting behaviours we talked about, but then another huge part of the work that we do is around the skills for advocating for yourself because, you know, I wish we didn't have to do this work, but often people really have to push very hard in order to get tests and treatments and to get the support that they might need to get pregnant. Um, So we talk a lot about how we can set boundaries in those kind of conversations and make the, the healthcare professionals really aware of what is, is and isn't okay to talk about, especially for people with histories of eating disorders and disordered eating, things like talking about diet and having being weighed and stuff can be really super triggering. So I think teaching people how to set those boundaries and those appointments can be really helpful in having a more productive conversation. Um, and also getting them to, to, kind of figure out the best way for them to have those conversations, whether that's taking in a partner for support, whether that's making sure they book the appointment at a time of day when they feel that they've got that the most energy to have those conversations, taking copious notes and researching to support them if they need it. Um, and yeah, just really learning how to be difficult patients because the power dynamic that's set up often between, you know, as, as patients and with our health conditions is often very unbalanced so we often are told that you've got to do what your doctor says and you know like that's what your job is just to take the pill and go so turning that around and creating a more equal power dynamic in that situation can be really tricky but it's just giving people that knowledge and letting them feel more empowered around it so that they can go in and have these difficult conversations and advocate for themselves yeah, because it seems like not going to the doctor for your prenatal care is not really an option. I was just reading the statistics around infant mortality, and and they're definitely connected with a lack of prenatal care. Mm, and we know that with weight stigma, like people are much less likely to want to go and see their doctor if they've been shamed or judged before, and the care they receive with their doctor, their appointments might be shorter, or they might not get this offered the same tests and treatments. So it's I think giving that people the information of what they can and cannot ask for can be really helpful. Yeah. It's such a really important topic that I just feel like is not really, I don't know. It, it's, it's not discussed. I mean, I, it, it seems like so many times this is like a message that comes up on boards, on, 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 on listservs that we're on, on, on Facebook groups on and on and on of, of just the struggle. And, you know, I think it's just one of those areas where weight stigma is so wrought and impacting so many people's lives and hopefully conversations like this start to move the dial a little bit because it's, it's really shameful how much people are suffering and being treated very poorly. Yeah. I mean, it's just the stories that I get of how people are treated in these situations. It just, it really, you know, it makes me want to cry and shout at the same time because like people are sharing with me that they're being fat shamed when they're having a miscarriage or, they're being told by their doctor that there's no way that they can get pregnant and it's all their fault. And, you know, there's just so much of this stigma and shame and guilt around this area. And it just, yeah, it just, it fills me with fury. Mm. Yeah. Do you, are there any support groups online that you recommend or, yeah, I'm just curious about 
what the help is that's out there. I mean, you're obviously helping people. So, um, mm -hmm. so I have a Facebook group that people can come and join. Awesome. Um, it's called fat and fertile and that's a fat positive. If you don't talk about diets, don't talk about weight loss in that Facebook group. Um, I think we're about 900 people now. So, you know, this, this affects a lot of people and it's, sometimes it's just really nice to, to find other people who are going through the same thing because in, when you're in a bigger body, you don't want to talk about this stuff with other people because you're not sure how they're going to take it. And often, more often than not, it's just going to be the, well, have you thought about losing weight conversation or, you know, it's not healthy for you to get pregnant at your size conversation. So people just don't tend to talk about it. Yeah. So much shame. Mm. Yeah, for sure. What are some of the things you notice in that Facebook group? If you don't mind just sharing, I'm, I'd, I'd love to hear some just sort of anecdotal things that you see there. Yeah. So a lot of, we have a lot of conversations around people trying to find clinics that will support them. And off the back of that, I just set up like a blog post on my website that's, I'm trying to capture people's recommendations of clinics that they can find that will support them at their current BMI and won't like force them to lose weight in order to get pregnant. So that is a really nice way of people connecting and sharing like what clinics they found are helpful, what doctors they found helpful, because sometimes that can be the, the piece of the puzzle because for some couples, if they're in a heterosexual relationship, they will still be denied um, fertility treatment, even if it's a male factor problem. So if the problem is low sperm count or something and the woman is completely healthy, they'll still be denied um, fertility treatment based on her BMI in a lot of clinics. So it's, yeah, there's so many things going on. And and other things in the Facebook group that people will talk about um, are just often things that, you know, in any fertility group, people will want to talk about, like, what ovulation sticks you're using and how you look at, you regulate your cycle and kind of looking at how you can, um, different supplements to try and things like that. But I think having people who are in bigger bodies together in a group People feel safer asking these questions and people knowing that they're not going to get the, well, you just need to lose weight or have you tried this diet or that diet or, you know, all those different things, which people automatically give you as advice when you're in a bigger body and want to get pregnant. Mm. I think that in community is so important mm. for folks, right? Just to be able to ask a question in safety without someone saying, oh, have you thought of losing weight? Yeah. And again, if you're somebody who's kind of got off the diet, train and you're trying to move forward without any kind of diets and weight loss stuff like being in a quote-unquote normal fertility group there's so much of that talk there's so much talk about have you tried this diet have you tried that diet have you tried cutting out xyz and yeah you don't need that if you're recovering from disordered eating or an eating disorder mm. yeah i mean it i think people feel so mm. alone when they're trying to get pregnant and it also might be not something I want to share with everybody that they know, yes. too, because it's sort of like the fear of like, what if this doesn't work? And everybody's like, hey, how, are you pregnant oh, yet? Yeah. You know, so it sounds like a like a Facebook group in this case would be so helpful. Mm. And people are obviously still concerned about, you know, does it show up on their profile? Because people really don't want others to know because of the, the worry and the shame. And, you know, especially for if people have got things like recurrent miscarriage where they um, are worried that if they do get pregnant that they might miscarry, then having that, you know, people continually asking about their, are they pregnant yet or have they got pregnant and how's their pregnancy going, it, it can make things a lot more difficult and a lot more stressful. Yeah. Well, this was so helpful, I think, for people out there who have these questions about um, being in a larger body and fertility um so so tell us where people can find you so they can find out more about you know what you write about and the services you provide where where can they find you so i am most active on instagram my handle is fat positive fertility um, and my website is nicolasalmon.co.uk so all my stuff is on there about blogs and how people can work with me and you know I'm more than happy for anybody to get in touch if they have any questions about anything you know I, I'm happy to email people and share all the resources and tools and tips that I have with them amazing well thank you so much for being with us oh it's my absolute pleasure I'm so grateful for the invite guys mm -hmm.